failure is not an option. How many times have you heard it? However, even the best have failed. This is fail, inspiring resilience. But we celebrate stories of vulnerabilities, adversities, and strength shared by exceptional people to create a more resilient society. Because failure is indeed not an option, it is required to succeed. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. We hope that this message finds you well and healthy and safe with, with your family in this very extraordinary time. And welcome to FAIL live chat with some of the best professionals in the world. My name is Richard Zhang. I am a PhD candidate from the Department of Mathematics at MIT and a co-founder of FAIL. And my name is Eleonora Ricci. I work as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bologna in Italy in chemical engineering. We at FAIL believe in the power of resilience and the power of community. In the next hour, you will be hearing directly from, uh, one of, from our speaker today, uh, who will be presenting her, uh, her story of failures and moments of resilience. Now, Eleonora is going to talk a little bit about what we do at FAIL. Yeah, so um, for those who are here for the first time, let me just introduce a little bit about this uh, initiative. At FAIL, uh, we believe that what connects people the most beyond uh, interest, beyond expertise and qualifications uh, uh, is actually the human experience, the human experiences that we all face in our lives. And uh, there are some experiences, though, that uh, are more difficult to talk about than others. The difficult times, the setbacks, and uh, those failures that inevitably happen even when we try our best and our hardest. So at FAIL, uh, we want to create a space uh, in which we can have more open and honest conversations about failure and vulnerability mm -hmm. and discuss about how we as individuals and as a community can become more versatile and resilient. Uh, we aim at foster a more accepting and psychologically, safety, uh, a psychologically safe culture to be more creative, engaged and connected among ourselves. So as Richard mentioned, to do so, we invite exceptional people to share uh, their experiences and perspective on our stage and um, now with new uh, with this new series of live interviews now this series of interview is simultaneously streamed through our website facebook and youtube you will have the chance to ask questions to our speaker today uh, by leaving your qu questions in the comment sections on facebook and youtube so if you have any questions in your mind at any point in the talk please feel free to uh, comment in the in the section and our team member will pick it up from there. So if you want to watch our uh, previous interviews, you can find all of them in our YouTube channel. And uh, very soon, you will also be able to listen to them on Spotify. In the past episode, we have been uh, following up with previous failed speakers, which uh, returned to the stage in this new format we recently uh, kicked off. And uh, we are uh, very thrilled tonight to be welcoming our first new speaker of the season, Elizabeth Rowe. So for those who don't know her, Elizabeth is the principal flutist of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, which is one of the five most prominent orchestras in the United States and one of the greatest orchestras in the world. She's actually one of the two female principal musicians in the orchestra and also a passionate advocate about gender equality. In fact, she filled an equal pay lawsuit against the Boston Symphony Orchestra, which reverberated all throughout the, musical, the classical musical industry, starting very important conversations about the gender pay gap within. Also, uh, Elizabeth recently gave a very beautiful TED talk titled The Lonely Only, Transformed by Imagination and Vulnerability, that we highly recommend all of you to watch. So welcome, Elizabeth, and uh, thank you very much for uh, being with us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I am thrilled to be here talking to you today. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, now, uh, the, the, as you know, the format of the uh, event will be moderator interviews. Uh, we will be asking uh, a few questions and mostly just to get to know you a, a little bit uh, more uh, and to explore some of the themes that uh, you uh, graciously presented in the talk uh, at TEDx Beacon Street before turning into some of the audience uh, Q&A. So I guess first, uh, I just want to, um, because you are the, the, the very first 
new speaker to the fail stage. Uh, I, I just want you to maybe tell us a little bit about your background, uh, who you are, and why you accepted the invitation to join the fail chat. Thank you. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm the principal flutist of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. I've had that position since 2004. Um, I held positions in a number of other American orchestras leading up until then and have been really devoted to classical music ever since I was, you know, 10 years old approximately and very focused on this career for, for my, for my uh, entire life. So, um, what was really interesting to me in looking at your work and I'm thinking about speaking to you today is thinking about how failure in the context of an industry, my industry, which marries this incredibly high technological or um, the technical demands of our craft of a certain aspiration towards perfection on the one hand, and this very vulnerable personal expression that we marry to that as part of, of the work that we do. So the concept of failure or of perfection is very interesting to me in how we address that as performing classical musicians. Yeah, so uh, I guess that you have a very, um a very unique perspective on uh, on the topic of uh, perfectionism and uh, trying to attain and to reach uh, this uh, um, unattainable goal, let's say, because uh, I guess that uh, in our platform uh, we, we preach that we want to create an environment that is more accepting uh, of errors uh, and uh, of uh, people being free uh, to experiment and make mistakes, but uh, there are some moments and some circumstances in which mistakes are unacceptable and uh, uh, just uh, and also um, there are several kinds of mistakes i mean there are obvious mistakes and there are mistakes that uh, uh, depends also on the perceptions of uh, um, different peoples so how do you how do you relate to this uh, in uh, in your in your in your work and your experience as a as a top level musician classical musician that's a wonderful question and i think that um you know, certain kinds of mistakes are clear. We can play a wrong note, we can miss an entrance, we can, you know, have some kind of technical catastrophe. Um, and there's a certain kind of resilience that we need to develop to withstand those kinds of mistakes because we all make them. Um, and our ability to recover from those in the context of a live performance and to maintain kind of the flow that we need as performers and to stay in the moment is really, it's, it is part of our training and it's part of something that we address. But there's another piece of, of this question, which is really, I think, harder to grapple with. And that is the question of our own personal expression and um, our willingness to take risks, um, our willingness to try something that maybe feels authentic to us and doesn't communicate the way we wanted it to, to um, confront the kind of fear that comes from putting your own authentic self as an expressive musician out to the world and subjecting yourself to judgment that is by definition subjective. So. I think one of the things that's very interesting for me to think about is how we define courage, how we define success, how we define failure, um, and in the context of that piece of things, because I think there's a tremendous opportunity for us as artists to um, embrace the risk that comes from expressing ourselves. And there's also a, a, a very typical and common tendency to become guarded and cautious. Um, out of fear of the just genuine vulnerability that comes from setting ourselves up to not be loved or not be appreciated. And so I think there is the really difficult question for us as musicians. The technical piece is a little bit more clear and we practice mental resilience and we practice being able to um, let those performance mistakes go in the moment. But this is kind of a bigger concept of risk taking and of fear and courage and um, how we can get ourselves to a place of having the confidence to to take those risks and, and 
be willing to fail. Absolutely, uh, and I, I think you mentioned some some excellent points when it comes to risk taking and exposing your your vulnerability, a vulnerable self. And uh, as an artist, you know you 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 have your your job is to you know creatively express uh, the music piece or or the art piece. And you know some people will like it and other people won't. So th there is always the question of the the self worth, the intrinsic self value versus the the value. Uh, passed on by the external world. So I wonder, um, uh, uh, for for someone like you, um, how do you balance to? How do you balance, you know, your your intrinsic value versus uh, people liking you or disliking you? That's a great question. I think that we have to develop an awareness about kind of the stories that we tell about other people and the stories that we tell about ourselves. And so it's very easy to develop this narrative in our own minds about other people and how amazing they are and perfect and um, that they have this impeccable combination of, of, of this magical kind of effortless technical ease and artistry and confidence and they have all of this. And then we look at ourselves and we, in our own minds have this doubt and this, these questions and um, and I think that one of the one of the things that I think is interesting to contemplate is to test those stories a little bit and to test your own story about yourself and to say you know what is it that I believe in am I talking myself out of believing in my value am I uh, emphasizing my own mistakes and so, sort of setting up a confirmation bias kind of situation where I make a mistake and to me it's the most important thing in the world and that I think to myself that my colleagues or these other artists that I admire are impeccable players and they never make mistakes and yet if you think about it really carefully you realize they actually do and so I think some of what we do is we get tangled up in this in this complicated um, sense of our own narratives about our value and our um, what we have to offer. And we don't tend to have the imagination to, to understand that other people probably have those, their own internal dialogues that they're confronting as well, which is why I think these conversations are so valuable, um, especially when you're talking with people who are highly accomplished, who can admit to questioning themselves and doubting themselves. And so I think um, there's a, 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 a kind of an ongoing challenge that we all face to, to question the stories that we tell about ourselves and others. As a performer, also, we just, as a practical matter, have to decide that we are either going to buy into what the critics say or we are not. And you have to choose one or the other. You can't, you can't play halvesies. So if you're going to believe their praise, you have to believe their criticism. And if, so it's really, I just prefer to just let it all go and try to really hone in on my own values and what I find to be important, what I find to be inspiring, what I aspire to as an artist and as a performer, and to let some of those external voices um, go. But I will say that that's easier said than done. And it is especially, I think, because there's this enormous subjective quality to how we are perceived, you know, and because we're performers and we naturally wish for some feedback from our audience, just, you know, we're, we're doing this in community with the people that we're playing for. And so, you know, what performer doesn't like applause? So it, beca it becomes a very complex web to, d to disentangle that, that attachment to the success of, of our message if we measure it by their response or if we measure it by our own intrinsic set of aesthetic values or that. So I think it's an ongoing challenge to, to separate those out. Um, and it takes a certain amount of inward reflection and courage to hold true to your own, to your own um, aesthetic and your own voice. Yes, I, I can totally, I can totally understand how it is uh, a completely um, difficult balance to strike. Uh, also because I guess that uh, in, you can also drive uh, um, 
much um, energy to fuel also your creativity and your self-expression from the interaction with the public, from the feelings that you get from the audience. So you cannot entirely shut it off. So, um, but again, if you accept that uh, you're going to take the good energy, also the bad energy will flow in, and uh, it's uh, it's 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 an in, it's an ongoing struggle, I guess. It's an ongoing struggle. But um, no, you, you can so you go. No, I think that's I think that's exactly right, and I think that as I um, I really enjoy working with with some early professionals in my in my field, musicians who are in their twenties and you know early thirties, and talking to them about some of the struggles that they face, and this idea of imposter syndrome comes up a lot, right? This idea of do I you know, am I going to be discovered as the fraud that I secretly believe that I am? And um, and I think that there's it, that there's this interesting thing that happens when we are so accustomed to um, looking to ourselves for areas to improve as performers mm -hmm. and to be looking for the flaws so that we can try to work to get better and to develop our craft and our art that that then can we can then start to see those flaws as kind of intrinsic to us and that we are flawed, not that I need to continue to work on this one aspect of my, my playing. And so that piece of um, understanding our abilities, our current abilities and our current um, challenges to be something that is in progress and that is something that we are capable of changing versus attaching them kind of to who we are intrinsically as human beings. And I think that's where we also sometimes can bump up against some of these issues about intrinsic value versus external feedback. Yeah, exactly. And uh, as you also mentioned, uh, uh, we tend to build uh, this kind of, of narrative among uh, inside our heads. Uh, um, of our own image versus uh, the image of the people that we look up to. So for that, it's surely, uh, it's surely of paramount importance that uh, the people that uh, uh, we put on the pedestals actually take the first step uh, and uh, uh, show to us that uh, this kind of narrative, uh, uh, it's flawed because, I mean, everyone uh, goes through the same uh, kind of uh, um, struggles, internal struggles and external struggles uh, and, um, even if not now, they surely had uh, at, at an earlier stage of their life. So um, to recognize the, the, the importance of uh, one's position in order to take this, uh, to take this role for, uh, for other people uh, is, uh, is, uh, is surely very, very important. And uh, recently you had, uh, you had a chance to, to explore also this, uh, this side and uh, um, how that can lead you to um, connect to people uh, in a in a much more, uh, in a much closer way, in a much uh, um, sincere way, in a way. So um, I, I wonder if you would like to, to tell us, uh, us about that. I would, I would love to. This is one of the things that I'm most grateful for in my journey, in my professional life, is to have discovered the power that comes from being real with, especially in the position that I'm in, which is a, it is a position that can lend itself to being almost turned, you know, as you said, put on a pedestal or turned almost into a caricature of accomplishment. Um, and that for me to find a way to, to dismantle that when I'm in conversation with, um, well, really with anybody, but I think it's especially powerful for me when I'm working with some of these people who are also dedicated you know, professional musicians, but are earlier in their careers and who, um, what I have to offer to them is really the most important thing I have to offer to them is my flaws and it's my humanity. And, and I don't mean to say that as if I'm doing this for them, I actually get a tremendous amount of connection and community and, um, empathy through sharing that with them. So that is not something that I knew intuitively for my whole career. I, this is something I've discovered and largely being essentially led to it by some of these younger professionals and seeing that, you know, what they, what is most powerful for all of us really is to see the humanity in each other. And I think the more that those of us who are highly accomplished are put 
in these pedestals, it becomes a very brittle kind of definition of, 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 of what a person is. It's a very inflexible, unchangeable, um, fixed kind of set. And then I think that that pushes other people into a very fixed and brittle assessment of who they are. And then we get into these roles that are very um, kind of forced and artificial and very limiting. And I think that um, for me, the joy that has come from sharing my mistakes and um, sharing my insecurities and my vulnerability has, has um, been so profound. I have to it, with your indulgence, I'll tell you a really quick story. I um, during during this pandemic, um, the Boston Symphony released a bunch of video recordings of some of our live performances that we've done during the winter season. Um, and these were just general regular old performances. We weren't intending to record them for any special purposes. And um, at some point in the spring, the this video performance was released, and it was two enormous pieces for the flute. I have to pause and say that um, musicians are very narcissistic. So it's a, it's a really important piece if it features me a lot. So, uh, so, and so there were these two pieces that featured me a lot. And I thought, oh, I should probably listen to this and see what I did and how it went. And I was going along listening and in the middle of a very famous flute solo that I've been playing well for decades now, I played an enormous whopper of a wrong note, not just a quick little thing that went a little bit awry or something. It was just a big old clunker right in the middle. And my heart rate went up. I, I'm sure I turned bright red. I started, I could feel the nerves. I was ashamed. I was embarrassed. I was, you know, horrified by this. And I um, went into a kind of a panic and I thought, I can't have this out there. This is not acceptable. This does not reflect who I am. And I panicked about this. And then I had to just take a breath and remind myself that actually this is who I am. And I made a mistake. And it's one note. And to me, it felt, you know, enormous. But, um, and I actually shared this with a group of, of younger musicians that I, in, in a group, I mean, I started a Facebook group to kind of create a community for, for these musicians. I shared this experience with them and the response from them was overwhelming. And I, and they started to share their own, you know, pieces of their instrument falling off in this concert and this giant wrong note that happened here. And, you know, and this kind of upswell of empathy and of connection and of just human to human, um, the community was was extraordinary. And that really came from me playing one big old wrong note and then just saying that I did. But I think that just that act, that simple act provides an opportunity for us all to remember that we are not caricatures and that we are flawed and we do make mistakes and it's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Uh, Elizabeth, I feel like you could almost be the ambassador for fail because that's you know, exactly <laughs> what we're trying to do here. We're trying to you know, normalize and destigmatize failure and by telling people that, hey, you know, failures happen to happen to everyone, you know, yeah. and I, I can definitely relate relate to your um, self description of the, you know, the char being characterized by uh, others as, you know, as saints, as, as God, right? And when in fact, we're, we're really just human beings. Um, and I, I, I also want to share a story of, of from myself. Um, uh, as a, as as a PhD, I when I when I get to when I go to a company, you know, hired as an intern, uh, I'm often treated as the source of all knowledge, right? Like whenever people have have a question, they come to me, or you know, they they would ask, like, uh, you know, you, you must know this, right? Because you have a PhD. Oh, you must you you must uh, be able to like figure all the all of this out in a, in a week. When in, when in fact it took us took all of uh, all the rest of us like a month to figure it out. Right? So I, I said, why, why? Like, why? Why is it that if you are able to, if you, if only, if it takes you a month to to figure out the same level of complexity can be grasped by me for for like three days just because I'm a PhD? No, that's not how it works, right? Um, so I think, and on the other hand, the the very notion of humble leadership is exactly what we're trying to instill in in people through uh, something like fail. You know, by by the very uh, you know, examples of yourself being a very humble leader, you know, being able to relate to uh, the, the mistakes and, and the struggles of, uh, of everyone else, uh, of everyone. I think that that is very, very important in, in building a, a, um, 
a psychologically safe workspace where people are much more willing to take risks because they know that taking risks won't ever be penalized you know if things fall apart and if anything taking risks is the very first step towards towards innovation and towards a, a better uh, better society for tomorrow and um, yeah so so I, and I, I want to uh, delve a little bit more into the into the imposter syndrome and uh, imposter syndrome is why we started fail at MIT and I think it's fair to say that a large uh, portion of, uh, of students from from MIT, from Harvard, and from some of the you know hyper competitive places, experience this uh, imposter syndrome, where they feel like they are they're just some kind of imposter that they just get lucky to to be there. So, um, what advice do you have on uh, on you know this, the semester is is starting, and uh, you know students are returning quote returning to school in a in a very very uh, extraordinary way. So to to so what advice do you have on you know college freshmen or entering level grad graduate students uh, on you know uh, keeping uh, being aware of imposter syndrome and, and tackling imposter syndrome? Well, what what would you have to say there? That's great. I think well, there's a couple of things. First of all, I think I want to say that it is not up to the students alone to sort this out because I think some aspects and elements of imposter syndrome are promoted by people in leadership positions who assign special value to certain people in mysterious ways and create kind of these cults of, of um, uh, I don't know, favorites or, uh, so I think that there's a way in which there is um, a power dynamic that sometimes actually can lead to um, these, uh, narratives about who is of value and who isn't or who is worthy and who isn't um, that really aren't grounded in, you know, reality or in anything that is kind of measurable. So I think when you're working in an environment, and I think this obviously exists in the arts because there's so much that's subjective, but I'm quite certain that it can exist equally as well in hard sciences and in all sorts of places where people have that special something or a a professor will just designate the really those special students. And so I think that this can be addressed, needs to be addressed actually, but in both directions. So I think, um, but to your question about students, um, you know, I think I almost always go back to talking about talking <laughs> and that, um, you know, I think so much of imposter syndrome comes from feeling alone from feeling like you are the only one who is struggling with something or who has a hard time figuring something out or that you your accomplishment um, because you have struggles with things or because you find things to be hard, whatever you've accomplished must somehow have been an accident. And so I think what's really important is to start to talk much more, much more freely about um, it can either be about imposter syndrome itself, but more importantly, I think it's about um, our own challenges that we are constantly facing, regardless of our external status. And so I think that can exist in, when there's a big hierarchy between, you know, a famous professor and a, an incoming freshman, but that can exist among the students themselves. And that idea of talking about, um, you know, what is hard, acknowledging things that are, that you struggle with, things that you might be successful at and you struggle with because those are not mutually exclusive. And to recognize that outward success almost never reflects inward, um, or it's never a, a, a perfect reflection of what your internal life is. So the more that we can know each other's experiences, I think the more we feel less alone and the more that questioning of our own place in the world, it starts to have some context. And so that we're not, um, again, telling ourselves stories all in our own head. And so that we can get out of our own head, start to hear other people's stories, start to share our own stories, start to develop context for this, and then realize, oh, that other person who's who has succeeded has flaws. I maybe have succeeded, and I also have flaws. And that doesn't undermine 
the validity of my success. So that, so that these, I think it's the ability to hold these two things together in, in your mind, success and flaws or failure or success and imperfection. So that when the success does enter your life, the, the, the fact that you have flaws and have had failures and have things that are hard for you doesn't cancel the validity of that success so that we don't start to have live in this very black and white kind of thinking that it's either one or the other. We're either successful and flawless or we are flawed and therefore this achievement must be a mistake and somebody's going to figure it out eventually. Yeah, for sure. We, we totally need to be all aware and uh, accepting uh, that we are round individuals and not just uh, monodimensional figures uh, in uh, one way or the other. For sure, I think that uh, creating the spaces to foster uh, a, um, an open communication among peers, especially in the coming semester for students, will be much more challenging than usual due to the circumstances. We will, be, we will need to be extremely creative in finding ways to create this, uh, these spaces because uh, for sure uh, we will um, we, we we are and we will continue to to, to miss the the, pos the the possibility to share the experiences uh, of our lives in the in the physical space uh, in, uh, in in education uh, and, uh, in, and in the workplace so that will call uh, for uh, all of our creativity in order to find uh, to find some ways to do that and um, for that reason, we try to move our efforts uh, to the digital space. Uh, so we are here tonight um, and we will try to see if, uh, if it is possible to move forward and to, to find even more way to, to, to connect, uh, to connect with people. And uh, I don't know if uh, what's been your experience uh, about uh, uh, finding connection uh, in, um, in this time. That's a great question. It's um, it, it actually has been um, this you're asking about during this pandemic that we're all in yes. where we're all, yes. So I, um, I, after a lot of searching for a way to find some meaning in my um, life, once my performance life stopped and um, I, I, decided to try to create essentially a community for these musicians that I've been talking a lot about today, these kind of early professional musicians that I relate to so so profoundly and that I'm so grateful to them for being with being open with each other and with me in the times that we've spent together. And so I actually I created a, a Facebook group and this is from somebody who knows nothing about social media, except for that I'm very suspicious of it for all the reasons that we're talking about, because it turns people into caricatures and, but we can talk about that another time. But, um, but my goal with this community was essentially to establish a very a safe, vulnerable, authentic space for people to talk about the whole totality of their existence as human beings on the planet, not just musicians, not, you know, that it's, that we are complete individuals and complete human beings. And um, that the, the, my observation in the several months that we've been building this community together is that the, by far the content or the kinds of discussions that gain the most um, enthusiastic response, the most outreach, uh, the most empathy, the most connection are the ones around failures and struggles. And, um, the things that people are bumping up against. And that has been incredibly beautiful to see that happen. And to, even in a very challenging online environment, that to try to create a space that is that feels safe enough that people don't feel like they have to kind of curate this image of themselves. In fact, that's not, that's the antithesis of what we're trying to accomplish. And so I think there are, and, you know, for me, it's been a tremendous gift because I've been able to share in that community and that empathy and that connection as well. And um, so, uh, you know, I, as a, a fairly, again, skeptical person about the powers of social media, um, have 
been doing my best to try to harness it for good. Um, and I think that there is a genuine desire for all of us to feel, obviously, to feel connection, to feel connected. And I think that um, one of the, you know, one of the lessons that I have learned throughout my career, and especially more recently, is that we don't need to have identical experiences in order to relate to each other. We don't need to have identical professions, careers, backgrounds. You know, we can be, the whole diversity of humanity has a lot of shared experiences that if we can just start the conversation going, we find them. And that was something that took me a long time to learn. I spent a long time thinking, you know, I'm the only female principal flu and I'm the only this and I'm the only of that and feeling very isolated because I had a very narrow view of what I thought was required for me to relate to somebody else. And I think we all can fall into that trap sometimes of feeling like we can only relate to people who are very similar to us or have very similar experiences. And I think that one of the lessons that I have learned is that it doesn't take a lot to find a moment of empathy between two human beings. It just requires the willingness to be vulnerable and to be authentic. And very often that is just a little flash of connection of a shared experience is, is all that it takes really to make you feel better and to make you feel connected. And um, I'm in a way inspired by the reach that we have now with the internet and with all of this and the ability to find these points of connection, even in this kind of two-dimensional realm of online you know interaction i think there is opportunity there to, to to make those connections and i'm i'm enjoying exploring that myself absolutely and i think uh everyone is just so grateful to to the power of uh modern technology to be able to connect uh people uh in in different ways like i am physically located in atlanta georgia uh, you are in probably in the state of massachusetts and eleanor is tuning in from from italy so we are as we speak we are in three very three very different cities but we are all able to come to this platform and share our experiences together so so the so the experience created by modern technology is very much unparalleled to uh what we had uh compared to what we had centuries ago um on top of seeking uh, external connection, um, I wonder what individuals can do to sort of uh, to to reach out internally to uh, to search for their to search for their souls. And I, I think you know, uh, Elizabeth, we've talked offline about how you know you've managed to use this uh, uh, th this period of time, this uh, extraordinary period of time, to do some uh, to do some uh, you know. Uh, uh, self-searching to do some passion projects. So I wonder, you know, what your experience has been like, you know, reaching deep inside your, inside yourself. Great, great question. Um, yeah. It's hard. It's, I think when we lose our, I can say for myself that I didn't realize how much I took for granted the structure of my, and the stability of my, not just my work life, but sort of the way it defined who I was. People said, who are you? I said, I'm the principal flutist of the Boston Symphony, which is really only a tiny part of who I am, but it's a very convenient thing to say. And so, um, and of course I still have that position, but functionally in the moment, there's not really a lot in my life that is happening that is in that realm at the moment. And so it, for me, it has been a really interesting period of time to, to turn inward and to, to kind of explore have the opportunity to reflect on bigger, broader ideas of what motivates me and what's interesting to me. And um, to start to actually think about more about how to support this idea of the whole human being within the context of our career and to, to start actually working with people to help them do that, um, have that kind of internal dialogue also, and to, to take the risk myself essentially of stepping a little bit out of my very comfortable, very well-defined career as principal flutist of the Boston Symphony and to think about what I, what do I value about that piece of my life? What are some things that maybe are that I could 
put more energy into what are ways that I can explore um, what's really important to me. And I think we often don't have the opportunity to do that. When you're in school, you're driving, driving, driving forward. You know, when you are then you, in your career, you're going, going, going. And this has, after quite a period of initial, for me, instability and, and shock, um, has morphed into an opportunity for me to really explore some of these very things that we're talking about um, in a way that's been extremely um, satisfying to me. I, I, I do want to actually circle back to, to a thought that I had earlier that um, I want to make sure that we spend a minute on, which is that after, as we're spending this time talking about failure and all of that, I, I think it's important for us also to acknowledge that failure looks really different for different people, depending on their circumstances and their socioeconomic status and their, the, the, um, cultures and societies in which they're living in and the kind of systemic issues that, that put some people in a position where they can fail with very few repercussions and other people in a position where failure is very different for them. So I know that's an enormous giant broad discussion to have probably bigger than the scope of today, but I think it's important also to, to acknowledge that failure um, for me is a low stakes game. It feels high stakes to me in my privileged position, but there are other um, many, many people for whom failure, the risk is is much greater. And I think that it's important as we're having this conversation to acknowledge that um, and then to continue with the conversation because it's it's an important conversation for us all to have. But I think that that context is, is also, um, that framework needs to be in there as well. Indeed, I mean, we, we must always be very mindful of this uh, and uh, of these distinctions. Uh, in a way, in a way, we can say that some of these are uh, still failures, but uh, at a societal level, um, the way that we um, that we have to um, different tiers uh, in society, it's uh, it's something that um, it's uh, it's a symptom of uh, of failure at uh, at the at the systemic level, and of course, uh, um, different uh, different positions. Uh, I mean, being in a different spot requires having. Uh, um, Different kinds of uh, of strength uh, and uh, and resi and resilience is, and resilience because uh, the challenges you're facing are at a different at a different level. But as you said, uh, for, for each person, uh, his own um, his own spot uh, is the best and the worst spot that there is in the world. So that's right. <laughs> I also because, think it's uh, interesting. It's interesting to think about failure for organizations too, and how organizations address failure. And I think that that's a, um, another way in which our fear of failure or fear of acknowledging failure can really prevent organizations from making changes or growing or addressing um, areas that really need to be improved for them. And that the fact that there's such a, a fear of basically coming out and saying, yeah, we blew it, or yeah, we could have done that a lot better. And I think, for us individually, that's hard to do for organizations. That can be very hard to do for whole systems and societies also. That can be really hard to do, um, but important, obviously, for growth and for change. Indeed. And um, as you mentioned, uh, it, it can be counterintuitive, but uh, you can drive uh, um, a sense of increased strength from sharing your vulnerability. I mean, uh, I wanted to circle back to that uh, to that example you gave before about uh, uh, sharing the one time you made this um, this so very public mistake and uh, in uh, in that way um, I mean this can this can really spark a different uh, um, a different debate about uh, what we define as uh, um, being strong or being uh, uh, weak are we are we strong when we hide or uh, uh, does that make us more weak in a way. Absolutely. And this was a this was a, a failure of mine, of my own understanding for a very long time, which was the idea that the stronger the, the facade and the, 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 the tougher the, the boundaries were that I could set and the, the more of an impression of perfection that I could project, the stronger I would be. And that was wrong. That was completely wrong. It was it makes sense how a person can 
kind of fall into that trap of thinking that way. But um, that led me into this very precarious position of being very isolated and also feeling as if I was walking on an extremely narrow ledge the whole time. And um, some of that comes from my, you know, circumstances in my position and feeling r rather isolated and very much, you know, as an, I called myself an only or a very, you know, um, with a, a very bright spotlight <laughs> on me. But I chose to assume that that spotlight was like really revealing the flaws. And I could have thought that that spotlight was just showing all of my wonderfulness. <laughs> and, but my, my way of handling that pressure and handling that was to try to build this kind of veneer of, of strength and of perfection and of, of um, impermeable kind of armor. And um, that left me actually in a very fragile place. And there's, I feel much stronger in myself, in my sense of my own security, in my, in my own confidence, in my own ability to withstand all the mistakes that I will continue to make. Now that I've kind of let that go and let that tactic that kind of defensive tactic go and try to kind of lean into the mistakes and then, and not just say I had made a mistake, but say I made a mistake and I felt horrible about it. And then I had to remind myself that it's not, you know, the sky didn't fall and, you know, to, to not just own up to the mistake, but also own up to how it made me feel about myself, which I think is another piece of things. There's sometimes a performative thing about mistakes. People are like, well, look at me, I crashed my car, you know? <laughs> and, and it's, that's, that's, oh, that it is helpful sometimes to see these big fails that are very spectacular. But I think what's more meaningful is to get the, the full story about that failure, whatever it was, and how difficult it is to walk yourself through that and to come out on the other side feeling like you have maybe not just survived it, but actually grown from it. And um, I think that that's not a, always a pretty process or a clean process. And I think it can also be easy to kind of perform our failures in a way that turns them into also a caricature. So I think the challenge is, is to stay really authentic about it and say, yeah, I'm embracing the idea of my failures, but I also hate it. <laughs> it sucks. Indeed. I mean, yeah, I would prefer not to have all these examples that I can put up there, but I have them. And so I'm going to like try to try to be genuine about the reality of how it feels to even share them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. indeed, uh, this is the. Um, the process is what people can relate to. Um, no one will ever be in the same exact spot making the exact same mistake you made, but uh, the process of working through it is what um, we all have to face some sometime, some sooner or later. Yeah. 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 And uh, I think I definitely relate to you, your point about taking an almost a, a facetious uh, approach towards, uh, towards failure. You know, there was one time when I... Um, I went on Priceline and bought a, a, um, a flight for $25 and I was really, really happy about it. And then uh, when I went to the airport, I decided to, you know, I felt so good about it that I decided to uh, join the long line for, for coffee and then I missed my flight. <laughs> and, you know, the next thing you know, I, I had to pay, you know, $300 uh, to, to, you know, get onto the next flight. So, you know, a, a, a cup of coffee ended up costing me $300. And you know, at, at that point, I was extremely, extremely frustrated with myself. I can't believe that I did this stupidest thing ever. But you know, looking back, it's, it's kind of funny, you know, now, now that I've gotten some distance. Um, and also, all the failures that I've experienced, all the frustrations, you know, they build up to, to who I am. And they, they became part of me. And I, I, felt, I felt proud about, you know, getting rejected by X, Y, Z. I felt, now I felt proud, it, uh, proud with the fact that um, uh, when I applied for colleges, for example, I got, re I, I applied for 10 and got rejected by nine colleges. All of them didn't, didn't decided they didn't like me. And, and I, I think, I think, you know, life could have taken a very different pathway for me, but I ended up, I end up where, where I am right now. And I believe that's, that's the best case scenario for myself. Um, so, yeah, so you, you, you know, you, you know, there was, um, well, I was I was watching uh, the movie Forrest Gump uh, lately, 
and it's, it's a great American classic, and uh, I think everyone needs to watch and rewatch it. Um, my favorite line from there is, life is like a box of chocolate. You never know what you're going to get. So the mistake that you make today, that the failures you experience uh, on, a, on a regular basis, they may just turn you into a, a completely um, different but, su but surprisingly pleasant a route that you never imagined before. So that, that's definitely a mindset that, you know, the growth mindset, that's definitely something we need to, we need to switch to. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think sometimes for those of us, all of us really, who are in these very high, um, these, these careers that put a premium on a, a level of kind of technical, I mean, I, I hate to keep coming back to the word perfection, but, you know, we're, we are striving. The idea is not that we are embracing kind of just general mediocrity. We are like, we are always striving to be better and to be greater, but trying not to become, trying not to let the failures stand in our way of that. And so, and, and I think that one of the interesting things that I think about too, is when we are looking at our, at our mistakes or our errors or the ways in which things didn't go the way we expected them to, are we, are we doing that from a place of observation or are we doing that from a place of judgment? And are we doing this as a from a place of this is something that I did or didn't do, or is it something that I am or am not? And I think that the place of observation allows us to observe, to learn, to think, to grow, to try again a different way. The judgment approach where it is I am a failure or I am flawed or I then that often ends up with us stuck and even not able to see what's next because we wouldn't even imagine that there is a next step if it really is truly our own intrinsic self that we're, that we're judging rather than observing uh, a choice we made or observing, a, in my case, the performance that I did or, a, you know, and I think that that's a really helpful distinction to keep in mind too, is that we can look, this is not about avoiding trying to get stronger or better or, or having more, accomplishment in our field. It's about using the powers of observation to do that rather than judgment to help us to, to help us be to know where we need to work, like what the work is we need to do. For sure, for sure. And you know, the, you know, all these different mindsets will, you know, help us, you know, get to where we want to be. Uh, but in the meantime, failures and, and rejections, they still hurt. And they hurt a lot at the moment. So we, we've got we've got a great question from Brian, um, our audience, and uh, she wants to ask Elizabeth, what is the main thing you think of uh, think of to keep yourself from getting discouraged uh, from rejection, uh, especially as a musician? <clears throat> That's a great question, and you know that is something that I had a lot of experience with early in my career, and many musicians do because we, at least I, took any number of auditions for jobs and didn't end up being offered the job. It's, and it's, it's a, it's a fairly common experience for musicians to, to go through. And I think it is easy to kind of go into this spiral of um, just deep despair and, and, and really profound sense of discouragement. Um, and I think that what helped me was um orienting myself back to the kind of a deeper exploration of my craft of my work. Um, so that again, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, I mean, I, definitely it, it hurts and it feels terrible when, when you receive these rejections. Um, but I, and you need to give yourself time to feel that. And, you know, we're not, we're not superheroes and we're not machines. So there's a lot, of just general, genuine emotional pain that comes from our rejection. And that's not something to feel bad about. In fact, that I think sometimes we even, again, talking about the stories we tell or the, the ways that we judge ourselves, the idea that we should feel ashamed for feeling bad about failing. <laughs> and so then we end up kind of doubling down on all of that. So I think it's important to take the time to feel the feel your feels and feel the rejection and feel the sadness and feel the feel that but then rather than turning that narrative into a thing that defines you 
look at it as an opportunity to explore deeper what you're trying to accomplish. So for me, that always pushed me to think more deeply, explore more, more fully my artistic voice, my um, interpretations, my, um, my vision for how I wanted things to sound. So as a musician, a lot of what we do is to develop this very, very rich three-dimensional, um, highly detailed, highly personal interpretation of the notes on the page. And I found that I was always able to dig more deeply into that and to peel back more layers. And when I could immerse myself in that work, it felt inspiring and it felt like I was making progress, which is a very different mindset from I lost that, lost that audition. They thought I was bad. I must be bad. I guess this is just what's happening now. And that it's a very easy mindset to slip into. But um, I think those two pieces to allow yourself to feel the pain and and not be ashamed about the pain and not feel like you are again, failing again for <laughs> feeling bad about it. And then finding the inspiration in your work to, to grow more. And I think if then it becomes again, orienting yourself outward towards the work that you're doing and towards the progress that you're wanting to make, as opposed to being turned in and, and kind of studying yourself for all your fatal flaws. Indeed, I mean, uh, this is so many, there are so many great points that you touch and uh, so many things that we can uh, surely, we should always keep these things in mind. The problem is that when you are in the spot, uh, it's difficult to, to think in terms of acceptance. And, uh, but uh, I mean, we, if we take the time and we train ourselves to uh, be mindful about this, we can for sure get better. <laughs> Well, and again, I want to say, too, that it can be tempting in a conversation like this to feel like there's like a right way to fail <laughs> and that you're failing at failing and that if you were just better at failing, then this would be so much easier. And I think that's the beauty of humanity and of our lives is that we are learning and evolving all of us and that nobody has the magic solution or the right answer or the a, a, a magic wand to kind of help us navigate through this. It's messy, it's painful, it's complicated, it, it's not linear. And the more we do these things, like what this incredible work that you guys are doing to talk about this and to just understand that there is this range of experiences and they all fit inside just this glorious human shared experience that we have, then it, I think it, I think, I think what you're doing, the whole focus of what you're doing is kind of the key to, to unlocking all of this. Thank you. Um, I was thinking now that uh, uh, this, this thought was sparked by a very good question from the audience that uh, we would like to ask and uh, use to perfectly close, uh, close the night. So um, sometimes uh, um, we can become a bit self-obsessed with uh, all of these uh, um stuff uh, i mean uh, uh, success failure uh, uh, imposter syndrome uh, it's all it's um, very much a, an inward journal a journey that uh, um, affects us as individuals but uh, every time we um we experience uh, uh, a, a major event a major setback uh, we are rarely alone in our life uh, uh, experiencing it so we have this great question from david from youtube and uh, he's asking uh, how uh, was uh, uh, your family affected by uh, your experience uh, when, uh, for example, you describe your feeling of loneliness and isolation uh, and then uh, the pretty, I guess, uh, uh, impactful experience of the lawsuit uh, and uh, your decision to react by it by starting uh, a, a, new, a, new, a new sense of community? That's great. So <clears throat> I think for me, much of my loneliness really was in my professional life. So I have remarkable friends. I have an extraordinarily supportive family. Um, I, so I think for them and for, for me, you know, that, that is a source of strength and of community that I did have. And so I think, again, that was, 
actually really one of the important things that allowed me to take the risks that I took in that time in my life. And um, that having that support and that community there enabled me to take some pretty major risks in my professional life. So, I, but I, I think it is interesting. I think we need all of that. I think we need community in our professional life and we need it in our personal lives. And I, I think that there are many people who have one or the other and not both. And that can contribute to a real profound sense of loneliness when you when you spend a very meaningful portion of your life feeling isolated and alone. So I, I, I again, this is something that I experienced. It's not something that defines me. So I am not permanently a lonely person, um, but I felt very lonely and created, contributed to my loneliness and my isolation in my professional life um, by these um, protective, this protective stance that I took of, of trying to maintain this facade of perfection and of, and of distance also of, of not allowing myself close enough to, to people to let them see the flaws. And um, so I think that that's something that's, that's, I think sometimes also people don't allow themselves to acknowledge that they feel lonely in one aspect of their life and not in another. I think people could be lonely in, um, in their friendship circle and have a strong marriage and have a great professional um, community. People can be lonely, you know, it, it, there, are, there are combinations of all of that. So I think that that's, I think for us to really feel fully in community, we really need it everywhere. And I think that that's um, what I discovered in this process. And it's what I feel like I have now, thanks to more willingness on my part to show the flaws and to talk about it and to find these ways to connect. Thank you, thank you very much. So I guess that uh, we are uh, uh, we are closing for tonight. So it was uh, a very wonderful, uh, a very wonder wonderful conversation. And uh, uh, thank you very much for being with us tonight and uh, for sharing uh, all your all of your insights on uh, on this topic. It's been wonderful, and uh, for sure, it's been wonderful also for uh, our audience uh, out there. And. Um, we would like uh, to encourage everyone uh, who is uh, um, who likes this kind of, uh, of initiatives and uh, of uh, um, conversations uh, to follow. Uh, first of all, um, what uh, Elizabeth does to well, to follow, to look at watch. I can I can make it to watch <laughs> her beautiful TED talk, and then uh, you can connect with the Fail platform on uh, all uh, major social media. Um, again, trying to take in the good part of the social media, not the bad. And uh, you can uh, listen to our previous talks on uh, um, Spotify. And um, um, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, uh, call of action that we want to do tonight is to invite you to the next uh, event that we will uh, uh, have uh, um, very soon, right, Richard? Yeah. So in fact, on the September, on the seventeenth of September, we will be inviting uh, another great speaker, Ethan Fisher. And just to tell you a little bit of who he is, Ethan is a keynote speaker and a mental health advocate. And he draws from his experience, life experience to challenge, motivate and inspire his audiences. From star high, uh, high school athlete to prison inmate to the recipient of an MBA with honors, Ethan's life is a lesson in accountability, passion and perseverance. A staunch mental health and subst a substance abuse advocate Ethan is the founder of Nonprofit to support education and prevention for students and student athletes. So it'll be very, very, it'll be a very interesting discussion. We highly encourage you to join all of us uh, on the night of uh, the 17th of September. And we look forward to staying in touch with you through various social media platforms. So thank you and good night. Thank you very much for attending. And thank you again, Elizabeth, for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me.